brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that supports life and family. 5% of your monthly plan price goes to your favorite charity. Buy the way you believe at CharityMobile.com and use promo code TRADITION. The question of does a pope lose the papal office if he is a heretic has, is something that has been widely debated in traditional Catholic circles. I have for you an article today, I'll just go over in its entirety, it's that good of a teaching document, written by a Society of St. Pius X priest. Now, for many of you, that will be a deal breaker by itself. I implore you, though, to open your mind, because all he does here is present what the theologians and the doctors of the church presented as this before the council. That's all he has to say. His short version of this, though, is that every theologian agreed that, yes, a pope does lose his papal primacy, does lose the office of pope if he is a heretic, that being a heretic is incompatible with the papacy. That's logical. He presents all the major arguments for it. But he says that is where the, the agreement ends. The mechanism of how and the rest of it is where the different theologians disagreed among one another. And I'll remind people here that the church itself, the magisterium, has never actually formally weighed in on this, which is unfortunate, but it's where we are. We are in essentially uncharted waters with Pope Francis. So we turn now to this article from the District of the USA SSPX website. The headline is A Question of Papal Heresy, Part 6a. Yes, there's six, at least six parts of this. You can find them on that website if you are so interested. The date on this is March 13th, 2017. Throughout the history, theologians have differed in their theses regarding the ability for a heretical pope to remain the vicar of Christ. The author of the series, Father Jean-Michel Glaise, has been a professor in the SSPX Seminary of St. Pius X in Nikon, Switzerland, for 20 years, where he is currently, as of 2017, teaching ecclesiology. He is the author of numerous articles in the Courier de Rome and is a consultant to the SSPX Commission responsible for doctrinal discussions with the Holy See. Part 6a. Does a pope who falls into heresy lose his investiture in, pri in the primacy? Now we can pause and say, who falls into heresy? Does a pope who falls into heresy lose his investiture? This sounds like it, it's a more of a question, though, about if a, someone who's already pope falls into heresy, as opposed to does someone who is a heretic before they are pope fall into heresy? Do they... Are they even capable of being Pope? That is a question many will ask because it is widely known that Jorge Mario Bergoglio, as Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, held to unorthodox, we'll say at the very least, positions on various matters before he was Pope. The opinion before Vatican II. The theologians who lived until Vatican Council II all answered this question in the affirmative. They are unanimous in declaring this fact. In the person of a Pope, the possession of the Supreme Pontificate is incompatible with heresy. They are no longer unanimous when it comes to explaining this fact and indicating the reason for it. Cardinal Juan de Torquemada, in his Summa de Ecclesia, Book 4, Part 2, Chapters 18-20, to writes that in the person of the Pope, the papacy is incompatible, not only with external but even with internal heresy. The mere fact that the Pope adheres in the internal form of his conscience to an error, contrary to doctrine, would result in the cessation of his papal office. The common opinion of medieval theologians is that a heretical pope in the external, and not just internal form, must and can be deposed by a human authority, since there is, they claimed, here on earth a power above his. This authority is superior to the pope by way of exception in the case of heresy. This could be the authority of the College of Cardinals, or possibly of an ecumenical council. Cajetan's Thesis Cajetan, in chapters 20-21 to 21 of his 1511 treatise, De compatione octiortatis pape et concili holds that there is an authority that can undo the investiture. In other words, cause the existence of the pontifical authority in the Pope's possession of it to cease. But Cajetan tries to differentiate his view from that of the theologians of the previous period by maintaining a principle that on earth there can be no authority superior to the Pope, not even in the case of heresy. Indeed, the authority that is required to cause the investiture to cease would be exercised not on the Pope but on the connection that exists between the person of the Pope and the papacy. Cajetan's thesis is adopted by Domenico Banez and by John of St. Thomas. More recently, Cardinal Charles Journet, 1891-1975, considered the argument penetrating. 
it is made up of two aspects. First, in that work, Kajitan states an authentic principle. The solution to the problem must, raised must be rooted in the source of revelation. Now, divine law is content to say that if the Pope becomes heretical, the Church must avoid him. In fact, we can cite at least six passages of Scripture in which God commands his people not to relate to a formal public heretic. Passages cited by Kajatan in, in subsection 281 include number 16 to 26, or numbers 16 to 26. Depart from these wicked men. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. Let him be anathema. In other words, separate yourself from him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 6. Withdraw yourselves from him. And 2 John chapter 10. Receive him not into the house, nor say to him, God speed you. The most eloquent passage, which Kajitan moreover cites constantly rather than the five others, is the one from the epistle of St. Paul to Titus, chapter 3, verse 10. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, avoid. Consequently, divine revelation teaches us no more and no less than this. The church must avoid any dealings with the heretical pope. Kajitan then proceeds to justify his own theory. He says that there is only one means of avoiding having anything to do with the heretical pope, in keeping with the requirement of divinely revealed law. This means is the exercise of a ministerial power that is not a power of jurisdiction, strictly speaking, the use of which implies no superiority over the Pope. Indeed, this power is none other than the very power that the Church uses to establish the Pope in his ministry. It is precise, its precise object is not the person of the man who receives the papacy, nor the papacy, in other words, the Pope as such, but the connection between the two. In other words, the relation that exists between the person who receives the papacy and the papacy itself. This power can be exercised in two directions, both to undo the connection as well as to make it. To illustrate this idea, Kajitan turns to an example. The generation or the corruption of a man is caused by an agent, that is power over the union between a matter and a form, inasmuch as it disposes the matter, without thereby having power over the form. Similarly, the church has the power to give the papacy to the person who receives it, or to take it away from the one who loses it, inasmuch as she disposes this person, without thereby having power over the papacy. As, Saint, as John of St. Thomas remarks, this explanation avoids saying that the Church is above the Pope as such. Indeed, the Church acts here only as an instrumental cause, or to bring about either the investiture or the cessation thereof. In the first case, the Church causes the person of the Pope the disposition required for the investiture, which is the appointment to the See of Rome. In the second case, the Church causes the person of the Pope a disposition that is incompatible with the office of Pope, which results therefore in the loss of this office. This incompatible disposition that the church causes is, the argument says, the notoriety of the heresy. And the incompatibility between the notorious heresy and the supreme pontificate is said to be taught by the divine revelation in Titus chapter 3, verse 10. Suarez's Opinion Francisco Suarez, in his De Fide Disputato 10 de Sumo Pontifice, states, like Cajetan, that the Pope does not lose his pontificate by reason of his heresy itself, whether it be secret or even notorious. He then presents what, in his opinion, is the common explanation of the theologians. A publicly and incorrigibly heretical, meaning pertinacious, pope loses the pontificate when the church declares his crime. This declaration constitutes a legitimate act of jurisdiction, but it is not a jurisdiction that exercises a superior power over the pope. In this case, the church is represented not by the cardinals, but by the ecumenical council. The latter can be convoked by someone other than the Pope, since it does not meet to define faith and morals. Suarez then explains the essential point of his thesis. He refuses to say that in this exceptional case the Church possesses a true power of jurisdiction over the Pope. The Church does nothing but declare in the name of Christ the Pope's heresy, which amounts to declaring that the Pope has become unworthy of the papacy. And by means of this declaration of the Church, Christ immediately takes the papacy back from the Pope. In a third logical moment, the Pope, who has fallen from his office, becomes inferior to the Church, and she can punish him. The thesis, therefore, is based entirely on one truth. This truth is that the previous declaration of the Church that notes the Pope's heresy is the necessary and sufficient condition for Christ to withdraw the papacy from the Pope. And Suarez proves this truth by saying that it is spelled out in the divine law of Revelation. In support of this, Suarez also cites Titus 3, verse 10, along with a passage from the first epistle of St. Clement of Rome, which allegedly says that Petrum dociese hereticum pape esse dipondem, that Peter who has taught something heretical must be deposed as Pope. The opinion of St. Robert Bellarmine, which is found in De Romano Pontifice, Book 2, Chapter 30, and which is followed by Cardinal Below, is purely theoretical because his real thesis is that the Pope will never fall into heresy. 
Assuming, nevertheless, that per impossibile the Pope happened to fall into public heresy, he would ipso facto lose the pontificate. As Bell Bellarmine explains clearly, the basis for this thesis is that a notorious heretic as such is no longer a member of the church. Now, the Pope necessarily must be part of the society of which he is the head. This is why the heretical Pope, no longer being a member of the church, ceases to be her visible head. If we adopt the explanation of St. Robert Bellarmine and of Cardinal Below, the dis disputed question then is, as of what moment can one say that the heresy is notorious in the case of the Pope? The Church's historic canon law, that would be from the Code of Canon Law of 1917, allows for persons other than the Pope an intermediary situation in which, if the heresy has not been manifestly sufficient, all acts of jurisdiction in the external form would remain valid, albeit illicit. By an analogy, a Pope who is formally but not yet notoriously heretical could for some time remain at the head of the Church. But below adds that providence could not permit the whole church to acknowledge her as her head a formal heretic. If the elevated man is or becomes formally heretical, this acknowledgement could not persist, and this is why the notor notoriety would have to appear rather quickly in one way or another. At the very most, it could happen that only a few pariti, or experts in the church, were endowed with the necessary theological intelligence to assess the whole situation. The others, in other words, almost the totality of the church, would not be capable of understanding the whole import of the crisis, even though their virtue of faith suffice for their personal conduct. St. Thomas Aquinas makes a similar distinction when he speaks about majores and minores, the greater and the lesser, with regard to the notoriety of the Messiah among our elder brothers. Finally, a recent study by Father Guillaume de Villes in part 6 of his study on the Doctrine Sociale et Politique Le Cure de Saint Thomas, at Article 9 in the journal, arrives at different conclusions. One can even go so far as to say that these conclusions are truly new, and therefore deserve wide attention, even though one may claim that they are based on the above-cited theologians, in particular on Cajetan. The hypothesis states, the Church, like any other society, has the power to depose a heretical pope by a delegation received from God in the case of heresy. The proof rests on two arguments. One, the authority of St. Clement of Rome in a passage from his epistle to the Corinthians. And two, an analogy with what happens in civil society in the case of tyranny. This boils down to saying, and the author states this explicitly at the outset of his study, that everything is based not on the divine positive law of revelation, but on simple natural law. Indeed, our author notes that all theologians have endeavored to justify their theses by citing the facts of revelation and Christ's positive institution. According to them, the deposal of the heretical pope would be necessary according to the teachings of scripture and tradition. Now, it is clear that revelation does not teach that. This is why the remaining option is to turn to the natural law. It is enough to apply the principle that the supernatural order presupposes the natural order. The church is a society. Now, in every society, natural divine law requires that in a case of tyranny, the citizens proclaim the dethronement of a power that may still be legal but has become illegitimate. And on the other hand, this natural divine law, which applies to the case of the city or society of the natural order, remains valid also in the case of the church, because she is a city in the supernatural order. This is why it is not only illicit but necessary to depose a heretical pope, because that pope is to the church what a tyrant is to natural society. And in order to do this, society receives, in that case, delegation from God. According to that last hypothesis, society receives delegation from God to do it. That means the people of God, in post-conciliar language, receive that authority to do it themselves. Now, for those of you who or maybe set of a contest watching this, will roll your eyes a little bit because what you just heard was almost certainly the best case made for recognize and resist, a position that most set of a contest, in fact, virtually all of them, deny. Recognize and resist being the position of the SSPX, certain elements within the FSSP. Uh, virtually all of your more popular traditionalist commentators on podcasts and YouTube and other places but that is the argument there, rooted in the writings of Cajetan, Suarez, St. Robert Bellarmine, um, even Torquemada, and a few others, that a heretical pope loses his office. They just disagree on the how. If you want to see a link to this, I'll have it in my show notes at returntotradition.org today. Let me know what you think of this in the comments, please, and hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. As they're sharing this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.